everybody, welcome to my channel, Thrills and Stitches. If you've not been here before, my name is Elisa and I'm creating my dream wardrobe from scratch. I'm taking you along for the ride so maybe you can create some of the things that I make at home. This week I have something really special and cool coming your way. I am sure you have heard about the show Bridgerton before. It's been a huge, huge hit on Netflix in December 2020. A lot of people watched it because of its Regency core aesthetic and obviously because of its compelling story and amazing actors. The show follows the Bridgerton family, sibling by sibling, apparently season through season, in their quest for love. I myself am a huge fan of the show, I just love everything Regency, I'm a huge Jane Austen fan and period drama sucker, so you can believe me when I say that I binge watched that show back when it first aired in about two days. So when I first heard about something called a Bridgerton ball, you best believe that I was very, very intrigued. My friend Kirsty and I first saw the advertisement sometime around July 2021. We we immediately checked it out and snatched ourselves some tickets. The ball was initially going to happen in November, however, I think due to the pandemic, production on the show as well as on the event got postponed. So we eventually went there in February 2022. So this ball was hosted by Secret Cinema and Fever. They are creating immersive live action events that center all around a specific show or movie and captivate their guests who have to dress up to the theme by playing out key scenes and moments from the specific show that the event is about. This was my very first secret cinema event and I loved every second of it. I had so much fun and I will definitely show you footage from the event at the very end of this video. So as you might have guessed by now, this video is all about me creating not one, but two Regency ball gowns for my friend Kirsty and myself. For inspiration for both of these dresses, I actually started pinning a lot of oil paintings on Pinterest from around 1800, 1805, where the Regency fashion peaked. I was really inspired by all of those beautiful pastel-y colors, by the heavy, beautiful fabrics that were used at the time, and actually also by the volume and the baby doll-like shape of all of these dresses. And obviously, aside from that, I also re-watched Bridgerton and had a very, very close look at all of the costumes. If you're interested in historic fashion, you might have noticed that the fashion in Bridgerton isn't all that accurate. It's a little bit too colorful for the actual time that the history in that show plays out. So all of the families have different colors that they like using predominantly. So the Bridgertons have all of these blue shades, which is what I leaned into for curses in my dress. But then the Featheringtons, for example, have um, very strong pinks and yellows and oranges for their dresses. With those colors in mind, I kind of sat down with my iPad and sketched out a couple of ideas. Both dresses have the same structural elements, um, which are actually quite similar to the dress that I'm wearing right now, which I made last year also inspired by Bridgerton. Both dresses have a square neckline, a cropped corset top, corset lacing in the back, and a very very simple straight skirt with some sort of whimsical top skirt on top of that. I definitely wanted both dresses to kind of like work together in tandem, not being the same but kind of like looking acquainted to each other. So it definitely came handy that we both had these like greenish blue colors for our dresses. Kirsty's dress is actually quite simple and I really leaned heavily into the beautiful fabric that we bought for her, with the sequined tulle top skirt being the star of the show. I also came up with these cute overlapped tulip sleeves for her, just because I think that they gave a bit of like visual interest and really added a nice touch. My dress is a little bit different. While Kirsty's dress is definitely more fit to her body and a little bit more lean, my dress has more volume in it. I bought this beautiful silk chiffon in a matching color to my satin to give it a more of a whimsical look. Because my dress was really quite simple overall compared to Kirsty's beautiful sequined tulle, I decided to go for a super embellished sash that I put on my own piercing. seam. Okay, so before I show you any of the sewing process, let's talk a little bit about the patterns for the dresses. So like I said, both dresses were structurally identical. I started out with a simple bodice block. I actually just recently uploaded a video on how to draft a bodice block from scratch. So if you would like to recreate this pattern, I would recommend you have a look at that video too. So the first thing I did was to shorten the bodice block. I did that by cutting it about 12 to 14 centimeters below the bust line. That really depends on how large your bust is. Think that it should end just about below where your bra usually hits. I then manipulated the front shoulder dart out of the way. You simply do that by closing the dart and retracing the shoulder with the dart gone and allowing the waist dart to become wider. 
Once I had the bodice without the shoulder dart, I could have a think on how I actually wanted the shape of the corset to be. So this is what both of them ended up looking. You can see I removed a good 1.5 centimeters from the center front. This is something that I recommend you do as well because your bodice will have had some ease accounted for, which you want to remove. I went with a square neckline with rounded edges in the front and back and the princess seam in both to have a place for the boning to go into. An additional piece you need to account for is the modesty panel, which is a simple square about the height of your center back. So my friend Kirsty and I actually spent quite a lot of time with each other in the run-up to the ball. We first went shopping together where we bought this beautiful seafoam blue satin for her as well as the sequins tool. And I actually forgot filming the entire day which I'm still so mad about because I actually wanted to film the fabric choosing process for you guys. But um, let me just tell you, we spent about like three to four hours I think in all the different fabric shops and we had a look at different colors. We first were thinking about getting something a little bit more corn blue for Kirsty because it's a beautiful color and it's really inspired by a lot of dresses that Daphne wears in the show. However, Kirsty has more of like greenish gray eyes, so we decided to go for something a little bit more steely, a little bit cooler than the corn blue would be. So we ended up with this beautiful seafoam green. We actually first found the sequins tool, which we fell in love with because it's so whimsical and it kind of reminded us of like ocean waves. Um, and then we found the base fabric, the satin, after the fact. On that same day, we actually had some time left so I could start with the bodice for Kirsty and get it fitted for her, which if you make dresses for somebody else is a really quite important step to get the base shape right so you can do everything else later. So what I did is I first gave her the mock-up to try, which I already made a couple of days earlier. I made some changes to the mock-up, then I took the mock-up apart and used those pieces as pattern pieces for the shell fabric. So we actually had a really successful day because we found all the fabrics that we needed and I was also able to fit the corset for her. So I assembled all of the shell pattern pieces and I assembled all of the lining fabric pieces and in the lining, um, in the two layers of lining, I actually inserted the boning. So let me show you how I did that. Okay, so what I've done is I basically replicated the bodice in two layers of this satin fabric, which we bought as a lining for the dress. I'm going to make the corset out of this. And as a first step, I simply pinned all of the seams on top of each other so that they're perfectly aligned, as you can see here. I am now going to sew tunnels on top of these seams. So I will sew one seam down one side of the already existing seam about probably half a centimeter set off, and then do the same thing on the other side. So in total, I have a one centimeter tunnel going up this seam. I have some boning here, which I will then poke through these seams. So we have a boned corset. All right, let's go. So this is the first test, see if it goes through. Right, so I will cut this to length, a little bit shorter. And then I will cut this in half because I don't need it this wide. This way I'm saving boning. Yes, here we go. First bone is inserted and to keep it in place, I will sew over the top. Perfect. First one is done, let's go with the rest. And we basically have a bone corset. How cool. Now we can join the shell fabric with the corset, so I'm placing the corset so that the inside is facing me and I can tell that that is the inside because the boning kind of like curves outwards like this and I'm placing the shell fabric on top of that so that the right side is touching the left side of the corset. I'm now placing the seams so that they are perfectly aligned and now I'm going to pin my way around the neckline. 
pleased these layers match up perfectly all of the seams are in the exact same place so that's nice okay now i think we look rather clean i will try now to turn this around but first just snipping the seam allowance in the rounded corners so we have an easier time and now let's turn this around and now, because I think it looks good, I will try and understitch the seam allowance towards the corset. So I have to change my thread color again. So to, to finish the center back of the corset in a nice way like this, we are simply going to ensure that the shell and the lining match up. So I'm just uh, cutting that back here a little bit, just trimming it. I'm then going to take the lining and the shell and take it apart and flip this inside out so that the right sides are touching. I'm then placing a few pins and I'm going to give this a straight stitch. I'm then going to cut back this corner here like so, making sure I'm not hitting the seam. And then we can turn this inside out and we have a crisp, beautiful edge in the beautiful corner. I'm now going to give this a press. Okay, so before we can join the lining with the corset, I also have these pieces here out of my chiffon fabric. So as you can see, we have the side panel of the front and the side panel of the back, which we will now have to join at the side seams. And now I'm having the thought that I'm actually gonna join them so that they're so that the seam is hidden on the inside of this. So I'm gonna open this side seam up again so I can feed it in here. Here we go. As you can see. Once we sew this, we have a nicely joined side seam. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. Okay, so there's several things going on here. As you can see, I have uh, rejoined the side seams, as I said. And I also already tested out what I'm gonna do with the chiffon on the top here. So I added a basting stitch to the chiffon, which I'm gonna use to gather up the ease that I have um, accounted for in the chiffon. And what I have gathered here, I'm just gonna distribute so it looks even. I'm gonna give the neckline a straight stitch just to fixate everything in place. Okay, <laughs> let's hope this looks good in the end because I have no idea. Let's grab the actual corset and place it dead center, right side touching on our shell and then we can start pinning away. You think this looks like a total mess right now? Same. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried because there's so many layers of fabric that it's really, really hard to be exact. And I'm a little worried that I'm I'm not exact. And this is gonna look like a mess. <sighs> Let's hope for the best, I would say. Okay, so I've made some progress on this. It doesn't look so bad, I have to say. So far, so good. I joined the shoulders and now I'm gonna finish off the back the same way I did with Kirsty's dress. So the corset is more or less finished except for the sleeves. Um, that was easier than I thought. The closure is not yet on it, so the lacing, the corset lacing is still missing. But I'm thinking as a next step, because I'm going to do the corset lacing at the very end, I can focus on the skirt. All right, so once Kirsty's dress was actually assembled, I still had a whole other dress to go, which was mine. I myself had a beautiful teal satin in my stash that I have been meaning to use for ages and never quite knew what to make with it. So I decided to go for this one for this Regency ball gown. So actually at this point, after finishing Kirsty's dress, I switched ideas a bunch of times because I somehow was unsure about the fabric that I chose. I wasn't sure about the color. It kind of felt very strong to me, which, 
makes sense because the dress was supposed to be for a Bridgerton Regency ball, not like an actual Regency ball, where a color like this would have probably been a bit too strong. However, I'm so glad that I stuck with it because I just love the richness of the dress. I love the richness of the color and its jewel tone and also the way it flows. It's just very beautiful, so I'm really glad I stuck with the with my initial fabric. It's actually a really great coincidence because I just saw the trailer for season two the first time this week and I noticed that the love interest of Anthony in season two, I think her name is Kate Sharma, the actress is called Simone Ashley, is wearing a lot of these blue teal tones and one of her dresses specifically in the trailer seems like it's the exact same color as my dress which is such a coincidence and definitely was not planned but I'm here for it. So I wanted my dress to be a little bit more whimsical so I bought some silk chiffon to add a second layer um, of fabric to my dress to give it a bit more volume and a little bit more flow as well. So I added that to the corset as well as as a second layer to my skirt. So let me talk a little bit about how the skirt for both my dress and for Kirstie's dress worked. Luckily, the skirt pattern is a lot more simple than the corset pattern was, so let me explain. You basically just cut a rectangular piece of fabric, which should be at least half the width of the circumference of your hips, plus about 5 to 10 centimeters of ease, depending on how much volume you want, and the length from your empire seam to the floor. For a Kirstie skirt, for example, the width of the skirt was 110 centimeters wide and 120 centimeters long. So cut on a fold, you would measure 55 centimeters to the side and 120 centimeters down. Both Kirstie's and my dress had a second layer over the base skirt, with Kirstie's being sequin tulle and mine the silk chiffon. For that, you simply cut another rectangle similar to your base skirt, but this time add a little bit more ease. If you want a train, which my dress had for example, this is also something you will have to account for. speaking we have uh, this tube here now it's really just a very very straight skirt like that now for the train this is basically going over the skirt like that so let's try to figure this out okay now we have the underskirt panel and we have the top skirt panel first up I'm gonna add a gathering stitch to the top end of my train too. So I've got that done. Okay, now to the more exciting part. I've just finished the front of my little curtain that's gonna go on top of the underskirt. And now I have to figure out the placement. So I'm gonna grab my underskirt tube, basically, and I'm gonna place it so that the back is facing me. I will also determine where the center back is on my overskirt, so I'm gonna nip it here. I'm going to place the two skirts on top of each other so the center backs are aligned. Now, maybe what's also gonna be good is to not only determine the center back and center front, but also the sides. Since this is a tube, there is no side seam. Now I'm going to place these strategic spots on top of each other. So we have the side points and we have the center back that should meet up. Now in the front, once we turn this around, it's a little bit different because I don't want my overskirt to meet each other in the center front. I want it to be a little bit offset. I will have to grab my corset. So this is exactly how much offset I need. My overskirt should start exactly here and exactly here. I'm going to place this front part by folding it over once because I don't want the seam to be seen here necessarily. And then I'm gonna place it exactly so it starts at this point that I just determined. Okay, so we have the two skirt panels attached to each other, which is success, I would say. Next up, we need to join the skirt and the top.
idea is to insert an elastic here. Now my guess would be that it's gonna be open just about like so. Like you're gonna see the modesty panel just about that much. Which means that the elastic shouldn't be much wider than that. Unstretched, that is. In an unstretched form, it should be about that wide. So I take that and this is what I go with. And now I'm going to create that tunnel. Now that we have this tunnel, we should be able to insert the elastic. Okay, so now I created a few holes and put the eyelets in. Now I have this little tool, which I'm gonna fit onto the eyelet from one side. I'm gonna place it on my surface. I'm gonna take this ring, pop it on from the other side, and then I'll take this tool and place it on top of all of this. And then I need to apply some force. Now I'm going to attach my modest panel and I think I'm going to do that by hand. So I'm simply placing it on the back of my corset and I'm placing it here, putting it down and then I'm going to hand sew it on. So we have these little fish shaped pieces here which are going to become the sleeves. That's one sleeve, so four layers for one sleeve and then the other four layers for the other sleeve. So as you can see, these nicely overlap which kind of follows the design that I'm aiming for and later we will gather this up a little bit so it has a bit of a 3D texture to it. Now what I need to do is to sew these curves so I can overturn them. I have just overturned and pressed my sleeve pieces. Now what I will do is I will join the sleeve in this area, which is um, the underarm area in your armpit. And I'm simply going to do that by placing the two seams on top of each other, right sides touching. It looks a little convoluted, but you will see once we have given this a straight stitch and turned it the right side out, given it a press, we will have a beautiful seam here. Our beautiful sleeves ready to be inserted into the dress. I'm going to do that by taking the dress placing it in front of me so that the armhole is nice and available. And then I'm going to start with this seam. I'm going to place it dead center onto our side seam of the bodice. And that's where I start pinning. This is how the sleeves are going to look. This is the shoulder and this is kind of what it looks like from the front and the back. I'm later going to serge the seam and stitch it to the inside of the sleeve by hand. Here we go my friends. The train is attached to the main dress. I'm happy with this. And now the very very last thing is the hem. I'm simply going to fold it over once and then fold it over once again to create a double hem. Alright, so basically once everything was said and done with the dresses, the hem was done, the sleeves were in, there were just a few final touches that I had to do. For my dress, for example, I had to still embellish my white sash that was going to go on my empire seam. And true to the theme, I did that while watching Pride and Prejudice for about the 1000th time. <laughs> 
So for the styling of the dresses, um, we were having a little bit of a think about how we would do our hair and what kind of shoes we would wear and what kind of bags we would wear. And I actually had time on the day of the ball to create some cute little pouches for us. I don't actually know what you would call them. They're just like Thai Thai pouches. Let me show you. I really had a bit of stress making these, but I also didn't want us to show up with like super modern like clutches with our dresses because that would have just looked weird. <laughs> Kirsty and I both actually wore opera length white gloves to finish off the look, which I think made all the difference, and we both had our sashes. I also, very spoiled, um, ordered myself some shoes specifically to finish off the look just because I didn't want like some random shoes to ruin, ruin my dress. Today, it's a bit of a special day, because I have a friend here, Kirsty. We're gonna go to a special event tonight that we've planned for a really long time now, no? I think yeah, we... November or something we picked it. I think even November. longer. I think that was last summer that we got mm. the tickets. Yeah, we're coming in. So we're gonna go to a Bridgerton ball tonight. <laughs> Super stoked and exciting. Their secret cinema and fever event, I believe. Mm -hmm. And their top secret, nobody knows what they actually like look like on the inside because you have to hand in your phone. Um, Kirsty's friends already went there, right? Yeah, got some inside info, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think they do want to ruin the surprise, so oh, I'm yeah. hoping that it's going to be really fun. We also have alter egos uh, that we got assigned. Yeah, like personas. Personas. What's yours again? Kira Beaumont. Kira Beaumont. Mm -hmm. And I am Eliza Salt. Which <laughs> Not far off the the truth in it. <laughs> and we have like a family crest and a mission or something like this. So they came up with this whole narrative and story, which I think is quite cool. Mm -hmm. um, we also have dance cards, although I don't think that there will be lots of men at this event tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's a real ball with like lots of things you can do there. The whole point of this is that you dress up, which is what this video is about. And that was quite a process, let me tell you. I think we started a month ago. I mean, you did it amazingly quickly. <laughs> when you said you were going to put Nate Ruth dresses, I thought it would take months, but... I mean, I really, I talked you into this, didn't I? You wanted to buy a dress. I was kind of hoping you might offer, to be honest. <laughs> right, very soon. I started sending her these links of dresses that I might try and buy on eBay, and then she said, oh, I can make you one. I said, oh, thank God for that. We said you never asked. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing we did was go shopping, no? We went uh, fabric shopping, which I completely forgot to record. I'm still very mad about <laughs> it, um, I have to say. We had a fun day though. We were too engrossed in the fabric. Yeah, we were, we were very invested. As you can see, we already have our hair done. We already wear our best, uh, most glamorous, jewelry. glamorous and uh, expensive jewelry. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna get dressed now and we have to leave soon because mm -hmm. otherwise we're gonna be late. Okay, I think we're ready.
let me tell you guys, the event was so much fun. It was so immersive. I really felt like I dived into the world of Bridgerton. We arrived there a little bit late, <laughs> but we made it anyways. They actually took our phones away, so I wasn't able to record any of the actual event, which makes a lot of sense because it was basically like a live action theater where the audience is like super immersed. They played out some key roles on the center stage in the ballroom and did a lot of like ad-libbing and improv in between those bigger scenes in the different areas of the event space. So basically they recreated the Queen's Garden, they recreated a sort of room that looks a little bit like it would be around the Bridgerton's house with like wisteria trees that were just absolutely amazing and looked like the most beautiful photo backdrop. From that room you could either enter a bar, which is where a lot of improving would happen, you could enter a room where there was a boxing arena from the show, which was so much fun. They played a lot of like Irish folk songs for us to dance to, which was amazing. Um, you could also enter the drawing room, which yes, that was there too. And the biggest room of them all was the ballroom where all of the magic happened. We would dance there and all of the big scenes would play out there. All of the actors were absolutely amazing. They didn't just look like the original actors, they actually really sounded like them too. After the main event was over, there was also an after party, which is where all of the footage is from that we just saw, and we just had the best time. It was so much fun and I would definitely go again. <laughs> Alright, so I can't believe this video is finished. I had so much fun making it. This whole process of conceptualizing dresses, actually sewing them, going to the ball, editing this video, doing a recap now was well over two and a half months. So much has happened in that time and I hope you're all doing well out there. There's a lot going on in the world and it can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming, but it's important that we all stick together and, um, you know, do what we can to, to help. Alright, so at this point all I can say is thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it and if you did please leave a comment, give it a like, subscribe if you haven't yet because I'm all about doing things like this, I just love sewing and fashion and all of the things that come with it. So if you're intrigued and you want to know more then uh, hit the subscribe button and join us, it's gonna be fun. See you next time, enjoy watching season 2, bye! <laughs>